All right. Hey, this is Randy, and I'm going to do a video today about uh, possible World War III, um, maybe what to expect in the future, maybe a good mindset to have if you come across this video and you are, if you work for the light and you need analysis feel free to reach out to me um, and I'll see how maybe we could work together anyways uh, let's get going so I'm gonna play us uh, Steve Morgan's new album serenity off of Galaxy. I guess it's an exclusive partnership with them um, this album is on Amazon music Looks like currently you can stream it for free. If not, it's an album. Um, Galazis, like to me, as far as I know, she's Russian or maybe from Bel Belarus, possibly. Um, and she started making DJ mixes right. Or it's almost like I recall right. It's, she started making them just before COVID started. And I listened to them a lot, a lot of her mixes during COVID, so yeah, let's get into it. Um, let's see where to start. I'm gonna get up Google Maps. And then let me bring up Twitter. Um, yeah, I can use my generalized. Okay, here, Google Maps. Um, let's see what people are saying just in general. People are saying fear mongering. <laughs> I wish. I'm pretty serious. I um, I think at this time it's important to be as objective as possible because uh, human emotions are very uh, strong in war. It's a lot of what makes up war. Is the collective swing of human emotion um, and to win a war and what is winning a war surviving you have to keep your wits about you there's times for passion yeah absolutely but Passion doesn't help in necessarily making good decisions. And the hard thing with war is that we have time constraints, so we're unable to be able to necessarily take the time to think about things and surprises. So that makes thinking straight while you can even more important. Okay, so clearly there's a big conflict of what, like, who... Who is our enemy? Okay. Um, and then the question is, is there an enemy? So a lot of people see the Ashkenazi. You know what this, I don't know how long this YouTube video will last, but I'll try to use different languages. The Ashkenazi, which supposedly came from the Kazarians, um, who was a small, portion of land around I believe around the Baltic Sea northeast of Constantinople that you can go on the map um, that one time historically was due to conflict with their neighbors so they reigned in this region all around sorry around the Black Sea all around the Black Sea and I think right in here they were ultimately, I guess it was, yeah, like near Ukraine where we're fighting right now. Right in this region was their main thoroughfare. And the Russes, I think, put smushed them between um, the Western. So the Mongols pushed a group of people into Western Kazakhstan. I don't remember that. It maybe will come to me. Um, and they were smashed right here as the Kazarians. And as a result, 
they were forced to convert to one of the major religions, which I think at that time was probably near the end of uh, Eastern Roman Empire, like uh, the Greek Orthodox Constantinople religion split from um, the Catholic Roman religion. Um, so clearly, wow, we got Jerusalem, Gaza, Tel Aviv. So when Trump was president, he moved from Tel Aviv, supposedly the U.S. Um, consulate, he wanted to move into Jerusalem, and that, in a way, was deifying Jerusalem as the capital of Israel from the Washington establishment, in theory. Um, here is the conflict of what the West Zion Gate. I've never been to Jerusalem, so I don't remember the orientation. Tower of David, all oh, the Western Wall. Yep, there's the Western Wall and Dome of Barak. So there's this constant religious conflict between the wall below the mount and the Dome of the Rock on top. Okay. And Gaza, unfortunately, Egypt made a massive barbed wire wall here. So uh, transportation between these regions are very limited like look at okay so look at this so this is one board look how small that road is that's one border access through israel in the gaza direct access temporarily closed the rafa rafa crossing no one's going in and out of here so these people are see this is from objectively looking at it Geographically, the Palestinian people are in a very small region. And before the redisporia came back to Israel, this was all Palestinian land. And this is where they're isolated to. And there's been constant, this wall line here, this agreement line. 1950 agreement um, has constantly been getting edged in um, from the Israeli side so like I if we look at this from a purely humanitarian perspective with what we know as, as things currently are um, this, this is truly like a conquest it's the best way to say it is that Israelis came in and conquest Palestine. And now there's Jordan, Egypt, I think Lebanon are, yeah, parts of Lebanon are all trying to pick sides because they know if, say, if Jordan picks Iran's side, and Iran loses, you know, they're right on Israel's doorstep. So, essentially, the these really localized nations are having to decide on what side of the war do they want to end on. Um, and they want to try their best to be on the side of the war that ends winning. Because we have U.S. military ships, Navy coming in here. Let's see if we can get a port. Oh, marine traffic. Yeah. The marine traffic. Okay. So this is all the freighters and the, all the boats, transponder boats in the world right now. And it's very uh, informing. So a lot of boat traffic is migrated to going around the Cape of, what's it, Good Hope? K 
keep town. Yeah, things to keep a good hope. Even going up to Europe, like look how many boats from Europe are going around here. Because of the boats that have been getting the ships have been getting hit from Yemen. You know, they they've been flying drones from Yemen in the in the Gulf of Aden. And this is where it's thought that the Roosevelt aircraft carrier was hit. And then I believe it took, made way to, um, actually I'm not sure for, for certain, but I want to say they went to the United Arab Emirates, um, rather than go deeper into, is this the Red Sea? Yeah, into the Red Sea. Okay, so let's see who's out here. Who's that? Oh, drilling rig. So how many drilling rigs are Israel got? Um, offshore supply ship. Okay, yeah. So it's a mining drilling rig support. Mm, actually, they don't have, unless there's, I would think that all their rigs would be on the map. So one, either they're not on the map, which is a possibility, or they only have one. Okay. Uh, what's outside Tel Aviv? Uh, looks uh, German. Oh, vehicle carrier. Hmm. Okay, so a lot of container ships. You know, I actually think that I bet military transponders are actually off. I want to, yeah, I'm, I bet that's the case. So they're going to have to be relying on like satellite data to see the Navy. So let's go a satellite view back to Google Maps. Um, so I, w I want to say something though, you know, while you're watching this, all I am doing, I'm just going on an exploratory journey. You know, I don't have any premise or know what's going to happen. I just trying to state the facts as I understand them. Okay. So Tehran. So Tehran was hit with a missile. And you're somewhere in the presidential palace. I don't think I need to dig in too deep here, but somewhere in the center of Tehran. Um and I will say, if there is a, so I remember, I played this game Squad on a computer, and a couple of the levels are in Iraq. Um, and it's like a, kind of like a military simulator, a lot of teamwork involved, for example, and you have to work through the cities. And I bet those would be a pale in comparison to what it would be like in Tehran. I, you know what? Military analysts are not going to like this, but the age of large, expensive military equipment is done. The cruise missile was revolutionary for its time, but we have to remember that that cruise missile was pulled from um, the German buzz bombs with the glide bombs, that technology, um, with an incorporation of the V2 rocket engine, um, or the, the basics of the designs for that, right? So where this equip, where large equipment, which it's still effective, um, but the larger equipment like tanks and APCs, things like that, don't carry the same um, power differential as they used to. And this may sound, I actually think that APCs are going to be, and infantry are going to be more popular in this coming war than tanks will be. Because tanks have been made all but irrelevant, unless buried in somewhere and hidden to any sort of um, drones, just drone bombs. Because you can place a 
um, a package of C4 on the bottom of a medium heavyweight drone and plug in the detonator to it and land it right on top of the tank and very possibly like below the turret off. It's like, it's just not the same. You, you don't need to have, what like what does a, just the modern, anti, the Javelin anti-tank missile of the United States military, what's it cost? I bet at least $100,000. If you buy them in bulk, maybe 50,000. And, um, the, the one thing that, and even jets too, so jets are like very vulnerable to um, electric jamming. And the United States has focused on stealth, has stealth focused on stealth, which is powerful, no doubt. But the Russians have focused on electromagnetic warfare. Um, radio frequency interference, electric countermeasures. Imagine you're up in a jet and you have a jet buzz you and that jet shuts your jet off and your jet just starts free falling until it is 400 meters away because you get outside of that electromagnetic field and then your jet just boots up again. And that's something that you have to manage in a warfare environment. Now, arguably, the electromagnetic frequency shielding on the jet could be protective in most instances. But if one out of 12 times you're in a conflict like that, and that happens to be a card that can be played, um, that's a um, quite daunting thing to encounter. And let's not, so let's not kid ourselves, like, U.S., if you want to beat Russia, you know, you have to be able to get their, your jets through their um, missile battery mesh network. We don't have a missile battery mesh network like the Russians do. And this is my biggest argument against the United States. The United States is like, Russia, why, why are you stepping on our turf over here, right? And all you need to do is, what are the weapons capabilities and designs of each country? United States is medium to long range aircraft that can fly anywhere around it. And it has been utilized from all the, the navies and all these gulfs over the years. Um, and Russians are like, we have a giant homeland that we struggle to populate and the United States is saying that we want more land to conquer and deal with while having built a massive surface to air missile battery system that primarily covers every single providence or states that are in Russia, even up into these mountains at spots. And that's something that we want to send our jets into while simultaneously they have a functional nuclear network. Um, and we are at this strange precipice where there's people who can take us to nuclear war and those people include those who don't want to take us there and those who do want to take us there. And the thing with nuclear war is the earth will survive. Um, many humans will survive. 
some ecosystems will survive and the world over time will it will it will be painful but it will systematically heal but most of the populations major populations in the world will be will be lost and the earth would very well have a pole shift. I wouldn't be surprised if the earth is being bombarded from hundreds of angles by massive nuclear explosions on its surface that it will probably um, disrupt at least one seismic zone in a probably catastrophic way. That's, that's just mine. It's just how I see it. So maybe we'll talk about, well, if that happens, what areas of the world will survive? All right. I find it interesting that New Zealand has become this like super authoritarian p penal colony. And Christchurch, I've always wanted, I've actually kind of wanted to go there. Wow, that's beautiful. Look at that. So there's this volcanic eroded ring right next to Christchurch. That's awesome. Anyways, I remember some people in the past who I've worked that spent some time who actually were from New Zealand and they worked in Antarctica oftentimes. So they're actually a big, uh, they're like the direct supplier to the McMurdo station. So I th actually think that's where a lot of New Zealand's wealth has come from is them being like the last port call to Antarctica. Um, so New Zealand will probably survive, but they just made law that the military will force vaccinate anyone who refuses um, the next time there's a pandemic. So that's pretty serious. And Australia pretty much took after that over the, like right after them during the Australian lockdown. Um, but, you know, we can't let COVID fall behind us. Let's go to some images of it. Oh, yeah, so that's the water behind the Three Gorges Dam. And, yeah, let's look at the three. I really like the Three Gorges Dam. I'm going to go back to the maps. Because I like to uh, zoom around. Take me there. Okay. Yeah. If I can close this. Close. Close. Okay. I'm gonna be able to rotate. Anyways, I won't I don't need to. Okay, so this is this is the Three Gorges Dam. Um and way up river it's yanks yeah the yangtze river so it's it's flooded this whole area and china has gone and made these like big actually decent sized cities along the river aside from the flooding in them they're probably really amazing places to live i'm not gonna lie because they're in these deep gorges um and if you could completely avoid all the damaging flooding that happens in this region, in some ways I think it could be like a paradise place. And I find, I actually hope that in the future the Chinese are like some of the best, most innovative engineers in re regards to how to build a city on top of a river. We need, so instead of trying to build the city next to the river you want to learn how to build it oh on top of it i think that makes sense um okay i lost the dam for a minute that's okay i don't i'll go back to it again so you know i cut some things out just for your time's sake just when i'm doing a quick search so sometimes the searches jump but, okay, so what about this dam? So their biggest concerns are actually like, so you see this hillside here and you see, 
these dirt farms and right here like oh that's a great example so look right here right so there's these little like sections of the hillside that just seem to be like pulling in this direction same as in here actually this one's not as bad but like right there that striation um the big concern is that these hillsides and here's some more examples You'll know a lot of this is clearing, but you can tell that how the clearing is done that there's these striations. Um, and the biggest concern is that one of these hillsides in a storm will mudslide into the water and all this water will, and mud will blast this way and just smack into this part of the dam. That's their biggest concern. And what they, so one thing that the engineers did a good job in is, so this dam isn't really super high. It's not nearly as high as like what, uh, the like Glen Canyon Dam is. Um, because part of it is, is that this is a navigable river and the freighters use these locks to go, there's like this big stair step that they go up and down um, and it's interesting because it's on the far side of the dam. Like it's almost a continuation of the dam. Um, and how this park, in a way, it, it functions as a bit of a um, a buttress for the flow of the river to to redirect it into here. And it actually has a bit of like a one thing that's kind of positive with the design is it has this like um the water flow would naturally come in here and do this big eddy and when that water hits this eddy so it hits here it will catch here into this alcove and into this these alcoves over here and then re-hit the current again that it becomes um a way to like transfer energy out of the water before it actually gets to the dam. Um, but back to the floodgates, see they have a lot of floodgates and what they do, so actually that's a pretty good image of how it looks like the cement has been washed and eroded away, is that they will, they'll say open like eight of these floodgates at high water and they'll keep these three closed. Or they'll open these ones, but keep this one closed. So if for some reason a little section fails, they just close it off and then they will reorient that water to their overflow while trying their best to take advantage of, I bet water goes through here. Yep, so that's probably an outlet. And this is their energy generating station. So you can see like there's the transformers. So that's probably an inlet for energy generation, which is very well under the ground here um and comes out here but all right i'm gonna go to wuhan it's down here somewhere yes chong i'd like to learn more languages i only know english that tells you how how motivated of a person i am um yanks wuhan Pretty sure Wuhan's downriver. Yep. Here's Wuhan. Okay. So the Wuhan wet market. Han Institute of Virology. Oh, okay. So there's the Institute of Virology. In the wet market. Where is the wet market? I looked it up once. The wet market is I don't want to say for certain, so I shouldn't say I think it's where it is. But if I recall at least the range of the map, it was about this far from the Wuhan Institute of Virology. So it was about like 10, maybe the 20 blocks away. So it's really quite close. And what I find is interesting is uh, some of the virologists, um, is it Peter Wasik? Yeah, so um, going to the Wuhan Institute of Virology, I found it interesting that Dr. Peter Dazik a couple days ago tweeted saying that 
in other words, he's like, I'm tired of the conspiracy theorists saying that this was a lab leak um, and that the lab leak theory doesn't deserve any sort of attention, right? Um, and I commented saying something of the effect, you know, there's also no evidence of it coming from the wet, mar wet market. The only evidence we have is of people at the wet market getting sick. And it's within a geographical local region of the Wuhan virus lab. So if it was just in comparison of whether it came from the wet market or it came from the lab, one or the two, at the very least, we have a 50-50% chance of evidence for that. And I think we have more evidence of it actually coming from the lab itself. So this is the problem that people get into when they start down the journey of lies is that pride blinds us to our hubris and we be, start to begin to think that we are the one who's most intelligent within our field and no one's intellect could possibly th see through our scheme. So the problem with people like Dr. Peter Daszak is he doesn't understand that there's people like me who know he never's heard of me, know he thinks I'm a nobody. My life experience has made me, has allowed me to have the perfect ability to deconstruct his lies. Um, and what do I mean by that? So he actually has quite an interesting bio. And if you've read this while sitting here, He's a bioscientist and he focuses on the emergence of viruses in wildlife. And he studied how those viruses have possibly affected these species um, through time and has even caused maybe some of them to become extinct. So this created for him a philosophy that, well, if that's the case with animals, that would be also the case with us humans that a virus could come and possibly kill all of us. And because of that, he thinks that preventative care would be the solution. So if I think that preventative care is a solution, that means that I need to research what it is that a, that a virus could possibly evolve into in the future within a controlled environment so that I can prepare a theoretical um, solution to a virus like that. And that is supposedly the academic argument for creating, what would we say, the um, genomic research, uh, print, what is it, the gain of function, sorry, gain of function research, and then using artificial intelligence to create a mRNA protein that could combat that viral strain. So I know a lot of people say that viruses aren't real, so they've never been isolated. Okay. I can, um, and they um, believe they lean on to say uh, terrain theory. I haven't. Okay, so I'm just gonna say so from. I personally haven't done a lot of research on one or the other. I probably should, and there may be some biases I still have that I don't understand, and there is a better description of it. But if I if I take the side of the scientists who, be who believe viruses are real, I full on understand, I can full on rationalize the approach that they are taking. Unfortunately, Dr. Peter Daszak, I may even argue that he had no idea of what COVID was going to become and what it was going to um, manifest in the world, manifest within people. Like what types of demons manifest within people when their survival appears to be at stake? 
what type of demons manifest within people when they are given a very easy um, no pushback ability for their message to and to be paid handsomely for it for their message to be deployed out onto the populace well we we've seen we've seen what people become um so yeah peter Daszak is trapped he's trapped and he knows it he got himself into it plain and simple okay let's look at god help us all world War three begins so people talk about the samson plan that israel would nuke the world um they would nuke the world if it came to their destruction. Whether they would or not, I don't know. But that is at least some of the talking that people have. Um, okay. Pegasus was launched from Qatar in the Persian Gulf. This was three hours ago. Possible Iran preemptive strain. Mm, not that plain. I don't know what that's about. Um, <laughs> it's just what it is. Yeah, so China and Taiwan, you know, I kind of, I actually, Taiwan, this is what I would say during this time. Like, this is, if I had counsel, this is my counsel, okay? Um, that is, I would begin trying to create negotiary talks with China and I think you sh you should be like the, n the new Hong Kong and I'm going to do like what I think is going to happen if the world world does go to war and maybe how I think could be the way out of it so I'm going to try to be the positive, like, how do, how do we get out of this? Unfortunately, I don't think there's any way out of this without someone, um, losing. And I kind of said that at the beginning of this video and there's two ways to lose. There's, there's one way we all lose if the world goes nuclear um except those who survive but those who survive also lose in a way because it's going to be many years of much difficulty and though you would come out of it it will be a pretty significant dark age i expect um, if it's not any more than this one is. So, uh, so United Kingdom is really being disrupted. And I know a lot of people are like, all right, let's look to look at paid actors. Who's doing this? Who's doing, who's doing that? It's, uh, it's native population against migrant population. And... There's the, the supposed uh, intermediary of the municipality who's supposed to be like governing this land so that it works to the municipality's financial benefit. Um, that's really why they do a lot of what they do. Is that the only thing they're interested in? The municipality, the only thing it's interested in is its bottom line and those who work for it making more than they did the year before um unfortunately and that's a lot of the challenge that they have going on there so it's like what we have much of the middle east displaced and northern africa displaced for the last um 40 years while simultaneously being rapidly transported to these locations via people that happen to, I think, not be allowed in Belarus. 
Um, and it's like, it's like, what do you do when you're a native person? It's like, what do you do? You start to fight. And those who are behind the walls, the municipality, who are the ones who are like, you know what, we are going to take authority over protection, security, um, rule of law. We're going to own all the equipment and have be paid full time to be able to dispense this justice all day long. Um, and you end up becoming kind of like a third wheel. And I don't know how England is going to manage it. Even in the United States, the amount of migrants that are in the United States are so there's so many of that to deport them is going like people are going to scream those who remain who think that these people should have some sort of dignity are just going to scream from the rooftops um and it's like it's gotten it's gotten to the point where anglo-saxon uh, Slavic, British, Scandinavian people, um, their genetic diversity is being absorbed by all the other races of the world. And see, the thing that gets me is that, you know, it's not that every single popul it's like every s most populaces in the world want to absorb the fe the Caucasian female into their population. I imagine it's because of their looks. And and then at the same time Caucasian men are having children with Asian women so here they are and they are pulling out all these Asian women um, from the Asian men and the Asian men if if China is any bit of an example is primarily young men who want to get married and they they have really interesting like mating dynamics so a Chinese woman who's like over 30 years old is considered too old to marry. Like, I've okay, I've heard this from a friend who was Chinese, and her mom was giving, saying, like, you know, you're get, you're getting old. You better get married because she was she is an academic in the United States. Um, while at the same time. The young men are competing so much for to have a wife that many families will save money together to buy, to put a pre-deposit down on a condo so that their son could have a place to live and that makes him more attractive in the dating market. Um, and that is a bit of what was behind the ever, is it the ever grant? Yeah. The ever grant fund having such challenges is that one, there was money deposited on these properties and that these property development co companies were going into default for some reason. Um, and I think that that had to do based upon the valuation of the Chinese dollar. So it's really interesting what's going on there and so that makes this dynamic where there's like a whole lot of young men in china that probably want to do something in the world and they see how dense their population is and they see their government and they're like do you know what i'm not saying chinese men are aggressive not at all but what i'm saying is that they're like they at least have their vision on broader shores, just like American male or the Western male has had his vision on foreign shores. Um, and so even China, for example, a lot of the 
their population has moved into like Ethiopia. And there's a lot of free trade zones in Eastern Africa that Chinese are moving in and starting factories. Um, and in a way, are it's it's a bit of the, it's a bit of the continuation of the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, is that this would be a, a far branch of the industrial cycle? And like historically, when you look at industrialization of the world, like what does what is industrialization? Industrialization is like think of um, a a populace at a certain tier. So there's like agrarian agrarian populace. So much Africa, agrarian populace, and they get into educational. So they they go into the education, and then they get into the industrial populace, or resource extraction populace, which is a lot of mining is in Africa, as well as um, um, now industry in the Red Sea region. Because like if you look at United Kingdom for a while, it's like there was a time that it was an agrarian populace, and you go to parts of England on the west side, whatever. And there's like old coal pits where they would dig in and mine coal, or there will be like a silver pit here and there. So it's really common for early civilizations to go through like a period of mining. Like it's not, it's not really a bad thing. A lot of what, let's say, evolution is is the free flow of information and knowledge, right? So if there isn't a free flow of information and knowledge, one isn't able to increase their standard of living. They're not able to increase the percent survival of a what a case selective species to survive, who are generally more intellectual. Um, and as a result of that, that's what we consider like nomadic, go real nomadic, and you're dealing with like Aborigines, right? Um, and traditionally, what happens is the industrial zones push out. So after, after the UK kind of like was resonant in India, and even after World War II was able to, I don't know where did they outsource a lot of their industry. Hmm. Oh yeah, probably Hong Kong. So I would say that a lot of United Kingdom's industry per se was outsourced to China, um, much of Eastern Europe is. Because Eastern Europe had like this option, they're like, well, we either rebuild the industrial base of our nations, which we can, um, or we instead trade our intelligence with nations that don't have that intelligence and they can rebuild it. And I think maybe that's what they more so opted for. And because of the Pratt and Woods agreement, after World War II, there was this um, a recollateralization of the United States and Europe because they quote unquote won that war, that previous war, to become the financial center of the world. And a lot of the conflict with um, the USSR was a bit of a, it was a multipolarization of the world between two superpowers, essentially and dispersed nations just like with the BRICS agreements is like Cuba for example with Russia the reason that Cuba um, had to go actually kind of became more Soviet was well it was a combination of things so the, the Soviet ideology in Cuba um, brought to you by um, Castro and Che Guevara and a few others so there was a group of brothers that were associated with the United States, maybe Florida, Orlando, um, who were running, who were pretty much in charge of running Cuba like a, uh, a banana republic. Um, and so there was a, there were forms of slavery in Cuba. This like this is real. There, there were forms of slavery in Cuba, and they're running it kind of like a banana republic. And um, Che Guevara and Castro, if I'm not mistaken, got their start in Mexico or maybe the Yucatan and they took a boat into Cuba and they staged the communist takeover. All right. So that led us into dealing, having Guantanamo Bay and the CIA 
wanting, so here's their cash cow that just got taken away by someone who was probably friends with the CIA in Orlando. And they're like, do you know what? We need you to help. We need you to take Cuba back. So then all of a sudden the CIA is going behind JFK's back and um, making a plan to have, I think, a bunch of mercenaries and people of Cuba descent who were aligned with these two brothers um, to want to go and try and take back Cuba. And that ended up being the Bay of Pigs fiasco, where I think that there was some sort of tip that this was happening and um, they found out about it. Um, I'm not real sure how we ended up keeping Guantanamo Bay, but for the most part, it's probably because there was a military encampment there that Fidel Castro never thought he, he decided he was never going to try and take it. Um, I don't have to look into why that is. All right, what else? So, uh, escalation. Israel has nukes. Iran, 75% probability. I don't know the exact probability, but average to high probability, they actually have nukes. Um, Russia and Iran have been exchanging military hardware. Iran has a very functional drone system that was probably modulated um, after that a Predator drone that crashed in Iran. It seemed to be real. Um, and they probably reverse engineered some of the tech, simplified it, and began to mass produce it. They're probably not as sophisticated or have quite as many um, optionalities, but in regards to being a buzz bomb, a glide bomb, it's very effective at that. Um, they may not have the range or the speed of a Scud missile, but they have the ability to fly places. Uh, so what's gonna happen? I think Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates are going to be in a tough spot. Supposedly they just, well, I don't, they seem to go under the carpet, but the contract of the petrol dollar appears to have ended recently. So the current American dollar is essentially upheld by nothing other than the strength of our military and people's fear that we will attack them if they do not align with us. But as I started with earlier in the video, our military capabilities, though I full on believe we have secret technologies that have not yet been released, at least in regards to our general, uh, general issue military equipment, though reliable and um, a functional it is kind of a linear which was very which in many regards is very effective in Iraq and Iran but we haven't had an update um, for far with vehicles for farmland warfare um since World War II um so it's and on a foreign land with like, you know, the Germans didn't take Russia. You know, when you play the game Risk, how hard it is to, to take, or actually it's easy to take, easier to take Russia and Risk because it only takes you one minute to get from Ukraine to the center of Russia. But here there's like, look at the expanse of scale. It, the range that has to be overcome it's just significant if you want to keep it per se. Um, so what's the best outcome? All right. To me, this is, this is the best outcome personally is Taiwan. And this is the best outcome for America. Okay, I'm gonna say that. I'm an American, I'm gonna say what I think is the very best outcome for America. Um, that China takes, Taiwan and China 
merge. You know, I think that Taiwan has a right to their independence, but I also think that sometimes you're not really given good options and that may be the best option. Um, South Korea and Japan remain themselves. They kind of just re remain their own nation and North Korea as well. Um, and North Korea just remains kind of a um, tertiary state of China. You know, like it's fine. They've been like, they've been there that way for a long time. That Russia maintains its sovereignty that, uh, let's see here. What nations are these? Oh yeah, I'm in, I'm in Russia. That Finland, Sweden, and Norway maintain their integrity. Um, that Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and Belarus, Ukraine, Eastern Ukraine, Moldova, and Romania maintain a Russian identity. And that Lithuania, Poland, Czechia, Slovakia, maybe with Hungary, go into their own type of EU. They create their own EU. Um, and that Croatia, Bulgaria, and Romania too, they also create their own. It's like, instead of having this big European Union, it's like, maintain your individual sovereignty, but just work together towards common things. Because your neighbors, you rely upon each other for commerce, you have similar cultural identities, um, but at the same time, you still can have like, rousing soccer matches. Um, and all the rest of the Western Europe maintains the same too. But I think it, I think it requires a bit of a balkanization, as I heard someone say about when the original EU was put together. Instead of what they what they failed to do was consolidate the debt, um, and instead what they did is they made Greece still had this debt burden, um, Croatia, Italy. I think many of most of these have had had some sort of the Mediterranean nations have just had a, quit, a bit of a debt burden and if when they did create the EU that they let's say came to some sort of an agreement of how to either reconsolidate that debt burden or simply figure out a way to make it go away um, because as a result of that that debt burden though it was the can was kicked down the road Greece ultimately defaulted and then Germany pretty much footed the bill of it um, and that in itself makes Germany weaker and it also doesn't necessarily help Greece as much. Uh, it didn't really help in the restructuring because it had to get so bad first. Anyways, um, Africa, I think Africa just, Africa's a wild land, you know. I think it's okay to be like that. And if any luck, like, Africa will probably be the continent that survives. One of the continents that survives the best, as well as South America, if there is a nuclear war. Because Israel has nukes. Iran has nukes. They're going to probably nuke each other simultaneously. Um... And there's this thing, it's like, I'll be like, oh, Israel, protect, protect yourselves. But I also gonna be like, ooh, Iran, protect yourselves. And there's a certain, I feel like, you know, these men have to be met. The men are being men. This is, and not all men are the same. There's different types of men. And this is a battle between two different types of men that's in many regards age old. Like this isn't this isn't a new thing. Um 
so here we are. And what will happen to America, you know? America just has to look at her like this, like... You know, we we have it. We have super advanced UFO ET technology that has been going on in some aspects against much of the world, including its citizens, for a very long time. You know, I I love my this land. You know, it's. And when I say I'm from a nation, that's what I see, like United States of America, like that is my nation is these states. And we are, we are precariously vulnerable in a physical sense. Um, and that is why our government has turned to the the psychotronic and psychological warfare um, but that warfare is a program in and of itself um, and I personally feel like that that program is what is running running much of what's going on running these groups of people um and at the end of the day they're people but at the same time they don't even know what it is that they're doing and that makes it very difficult for people who are let's say conscious um because they want to simultaneously um, kill us at the same time and have us kill others at the same time. Um, and a lot of people like, you know, it doesn't, remember when I was talking about the Yangtze River and talking about the Three Gorges Dam earlier in this? You know, it's it's really similar. Like there's this thing where we had those Russian subs visit Cuba, right? Right along here. It's like, what do you think that is? Like, couldn't it full on be possible that right here in this gorge, or actually I know that's the surface, but let's say right here in um, this gorge right here, in the right down here that there is like a 80 kiloton bomb remote controlled right here that can tidal wave all of Miami or outside of New York five or six of them you know it's th this is just like conclusive deducive logic of what we are encounter what we encounter right now um, and much of Russia too will St. Petersburg would be nuked Moscow would be nuked um Probably all of the east point of Russia will be nuked. I remember reading um, the book, I think it was by Tom Clancy, A Red Storm Rising. And it was all about a war between the United States and Russia. And um, the very best thing I think that can happen is Iran destroys Israel Ukraine surrenders 
eastern Ukraine to Moscow. They negotiate with Belarus. Um, as I've said already, Taiwan joins China. Um, New Zealand becomes absorbed by Australia. Africa merges with the Saudis. Um, Europe would struggle. Um, I'm not sure without the economy. See, this is the thing about the economy is if the economy doesn't collapse, the immigration problem will not end. And that's what a lot of people don't understand is, well, it's not that they don't understand. It's like they don't like, how do you stop? How do you stop an economy? Well, you stop an economy by not moving money. So you try your very best to save as much as you can in dollar bills or gold and silver. And you try to reduce your payments as much as possible, right? Like cinching the belt and you try as, try as much as possible to keep the majority of your money actually out of the bank because it requires, because the lower the savings, the more reserves or the less reserves the banks have, the less ability they are to um, handle uh, um, financial waves. And uh, without the financial system ultimately collapsing, we put off the um, implementation of CBDCs as well as having the program networks required to administer the CBDC World Economic Forum um, super plan. So the problem is, is that, see, this is the thing that's tough, is that China has its own type of CBDC or social credit score, but Europe is also trying to create their own. And what Europe is saying is like, no, our form is going to be better. And China's like, no, our form is going to be better. And it's very difficult to have one's own. Other than, hopefully, I think what happens is that the United States, so Europe will probably create their own type of CBDC, um, even if all these things happen. But I don't know if America will. And I think America will probably build its financial, its new financial network on the blockchains, um, which include whatever is your favorite, other than meme coins. Um, that, is, like, that's kind of my perspective, and I think what is the best scenario. Um, really, if if we can put off nuclear war for a few months, which I don't know how that would be possible other than to, the only way that would be possible, I feel like, is if the nuclear arms in Israel were 100% known to have been um, neutralized. And Iran knew this and they didn't use their nuclear weapons. Um, but that's like highly unlikely, highly unlikely. So me even thinking about that the United States is going to remain intact if Donald Trump for some reason gets in office before there is actually a nuclear war. And that's even if he can stop it, maybe J, um, RFK Jr. can stop it, um, then there's a possibility that we can maintain the continental United States, but we will become like what the Soviet Union did post-USSR, where it became Russia and its own Balkanized states. And the Northeast will break off. New York, Philadelphia will, probably, will just become total hellholes. 
Appalachia, like that whole eastern seaboard, it will just be a total hellhole. And the Appalachians are going to have to be dealing with all the people from the coast coming up into them. Um, the deep south will probably be the best place to be. But a lot of people are already moving there. And we pretty much like ran out of time. Right? So it ain't going to be easy. Your very best bet is if you're like living somewhere where you can create a small industry, where you create a product of some sort that you're able to sell within a hundred mile radius. Like that's probably your very best bet for like a way of living if the United States goes into that. Because one thing at least is that if capital, if credit fails, then those with capital are going to be able to buy a lot of equipment. Um, the question is, is if you'll be able to get parts for that equipment um, or if you'll be able to get um, basic stock required to even um, create whatever product you're trying to create. Um, yeah, so that's my analysis.